Well, this morning, please turn with me to Psalm 42, as you saw in our video. We're continuing our series in the Psalms entitled, Walking with God in Everyday Life. Several years ago, in a magazine entitled Flying, one young pilot shared his experience of what, he's called, what he described as spatial disorientation. And he talked about it this way. He says, One of the best lessons I ever received from my flight instructor was a lesson of disorientation. It was fairly early in my flight training. We took off from Santa Monica Airport one late afternoon in the early summer. The weather, the weather was perfectly clear with light winds, but there was a huge or a thick marine layer slightly off the coast. And due to the LAX flight pass, we had to hug the coastline. As we skirted the Malibu, Malibu beachfront on our way toward the practice area, my instructor said, let me show you something. He told me to close my eyes for a few seconds. And while I had my eyes closed, he pointed the airplane toward the southwest, aiming it straight for the marine layer. He also put the airplane in a slightly banked altitude and the point with the exercise was not unusual attitudes. It was to see the hazards of poor visibility and disorientation. Once he told me to look up, I opened my eyes and was astonished at what I saw. I had no clue which way was up or down, and being inexperienced with the instruments, I had no way of figuring it out. And get this, he says, it was un nerving. Now, I know some of you here this morning, you, you've logged many hours in a cockpit. You know what it's like to fly and you understand this experience. But even if you've never flown as a pilot before, I'll bet some of his experience, some of what he's describing is something that you can relate to. You, you've been in those moments in life where it's hard to know which way's up. You've been in the fog. And, and you know what it's like. You know it's an overwhelming unnerving feeling. So what do we do in those disorienting moments? Where do we turn? How do we navigate those seasons, especially when they continue to get longer and longer and longer? This morning, those questions are what the psalmist is wrestling through. That's what he's dealing with in his own life, and we're being able to invite it in to, to, to go on this journey with him. And it's as if we have a divine flight instructor. He's calling us over. He's saying, come here, I want to show you something. I want to teach you something. I want you to see how important it is in the midst of a fog to trust your instruments, to trust what you know to be true. And so with that in mind, let's read Psalm 42 together. It says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you downcast cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. May the Lord reveal Himself to us through His Word this morning. One of the great things about the Psalms is that their structure, the beauty of their structure, even, even that is intended to teach us something. It's intended to guide us 
in our life. And this one in particular does that. It breaks kind of up into two sections. And some commentators think that even Psalm 43 originally was part of this psalm because it just continues on. But this morning, for the sake of time, we're going to be looking at those two sections. So if that's the structure of the psalm, that's the structure of the main two points of our message today. And in verses 1 through 5, we see that this psalmist, he's facing a spiritual trial. He's having to answer a spiritual trial. And on the other side, in verses 6 through 11, we see a psalmist who's dealing with spiritual taunts. He's wrestling and having to answer spiritual taunts. So those are our two sections. Both of those, the trials in his life and the taunts, the questions in his life, they've kind of plotted together. They're working together to kind of overwhelm him. To, to just to feel, feels like for him to be swept under. And interestingly, despite his very real and very painful situation, he responds to both the exact same way, by answering in faith. In other words, he's learning to fly. We're, we're seeing a man who's learning to fly by what he knows to be true in those moments where he can least see the way. He's, he's learning to fly by what he knows to be true in those moments in life, those times in life that you can relate to him where you can least see the way. So let's consider that first section, answering spiritual trials. The psalmist, he's facing horrific trials. There, there's physical trial, and from every way you look at it, he's dealing with a trial. There's physical trials, there's relational trials, there's emotional trials, there's mental trials, there's spiritual trials that he's facing. Commentators, they, they kind of speculate as, as to exactly what he's going through, the exact occasion of his writing. They're trying to pinpoint it down. But the truth is we don't exactly know because the psalmist doesn't tell us. And that's probably for our good because what automatically happens, at least in my own heart, is, is if you know exactly what happened, you begin to compare what you're facing and what he faced. And you, immediately what happens is you begin to do this comparison game. And it really isn't the point of the psalm. That's not the goal of the psalm. It's, it, it's, it doesn't bear the benefit that we're supposed to be getting. We're supposed to... This, the psalm actually does include enough information, though, that it's meant to invite us in. That's the goal. That's the point. It, it, it's invite us to relate to him in his journey, not to compare ourselves to him and our suffering and, and think of it as more irrelevant, but to invite us in and to see our own story and his story. We see in the psalm that this, the psalmist himself is a godly man. The title is, that he, at the beginning of the psalm, you see that he is a son of Korah. He's probably a royal singer who led congregations in singing. He may have been, even been one of the people who was among those who would lead like, cel the celebrations at festivals at the temple in Jerusalem. He held a, possibly he even held a high position among God's people. From now in, all, all indications now, though, from what, what we're seeing his testimony now, the indication is that that's not where he is anymore. He's been driven into exile up to the north. He's, he's all alone. He's, and, and really it seems like there's enemies that he has in his life who hate him, and, and they hate him for no good reason. His suffering is an unjust suffering, and he's been pushed out. He's been cut off from everything that's familiar. He's lost his friends, seems to be dealing with uh, physical hunger, starvation, and, and like we said, in, in every way possible, he's in a bad spot. And it, it appears that he's been that way for a long time. His troubles are relentless. They continue to be all-consuming in his life, and maybe you can relate to that. There's no break ever. Even, even the sad question that he asks of when will this end, as far as he knows, he doesn't have an answer. He doesn't, he doesn't know the answer to that. But despite all of these circumstances... The hardest part of this trial for the psalmist, the thing that, that makes it feel like it's unbearable, the hardest part for him is this feeling of abandonment by God himself. That's the, that's the part that's, that's just the most painful for him. Look at this vivid image in verse 1 that he uses to describe his situation. He says, as a deer pants for flowing streams. It's an animal, it's, it's, it's possibly a buck or something that's been chased to exhaustion. He's, he's on the verge of collapse in the middle of the desert, and in the heat. And the only thing that he desperately wants, the only thing that he desperately needs in the middle of this situation is the flowing stream. It, it sounds so appealing to him because he's drank from it before. He knows that in that stream is life. He knows that in that stream is refreshment, and he can just picture and imagine 
how refreshing it would be just to put his, put his parched tongue, the first few drops on his parched tongue. In the midst of a trial, the psalmist is beginning to learn, and we, we even heard this in, in uh, the Word of Faith this morning. But in the midst of a trial, the psalmist is learning that his greatest need and his greatest desire is the Lord, the presence of God himself. Look in verse 2. He says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Certainly we don't want to make light of what he's going through. There's real genuine suffering in his life, which we've seen the psalm captures that. There's physical, there's genuine physical and relational factors that are involved in his depressed state that you can't ignore those factors. The beginning of verse 3 describes that tears are his, his only food day and night. And so you, you can see all those things just collapsing in on him. But even if everything went back to the way it was for the psalmist, if tomorrow all the wrongs that he had, he had faced were made right, if he had a feast that was set before him that he could just enjoy, if he had his relationships and his position restored, and he's back among his friends, he's saying right here, he's learned that if God is not to be found in those things, if God's presence is not there, then even those things don't ultimately have a lasting comfort for his soul. He's learning that. Despite how he feels in the present, this is the voice of genuine faith in the psalmist. This, this trial, it's bringing this to light for him. It's drawing him, it's working to draw him towards the Lord. His feeling of abandonment by the Lord, it's not pushing him away from the Lord. Actually, it's drawing him towards the Lord. See, in good times, we may desire a lot of different things. Things that in themselves aren't necessarily bad. A certain career path. Hobbies. Sports, entertainment, the approval of others. In a lot of ways, these things, in, inherently, they're not bad. But you see, it's in the dark, the psalmist, where the, where the psalmist is. It's in the dark that the psalmist is learning that only, ultimately, Jesus Christ will do for him. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, he, he puts it like this. By day, there are many things that a Christian will desire besides his Lord. But in the night, he wants nothing but his God. I cannot understand how it is unless it is to be accounted for by the corruption of our spirit that when everything goes well with us, we are setting our affection first on this object, and then on another, and then on another. And that desire which is as insatiable as death and as deep as hell never rests satisfied. We are always wanting something, always desiring a yet beyond. But if you place a Christian in trouble, you will find that he does not want gold then, that he does not want carnal honor, then he wants his God. Is that your experience this morning? In the midst of a deep spiritual trial, where are you turning? Where are you going to? Can you say with the psalmist that what you need in that moment, what you desire in that moment above all things, is the presence of the Lord Jesus? If it's too hard to see in the midst of that, if you're saying, man, it is, I am so far into this fog, that it, I mean, my, this... this is so overwhelming me that I don't, I don't know, even know how to answer that. And this psalmist, and what he does, what happens in his life right here is just so helpful for us. He says, remember. Remember. Oh, how he remembers times of joy. How much comfort those days had brought to his soul. He, he longs to be back there. Christian, if you're in the midst of a bleak moment and you're saying, I don't even know how to answer that question. Remember. Remember what it was like to rejoice in God. Remember, remember those times when it was a joy to open his word and to spend time with him in prayer. Remember the happiness of gathering with, with brothers and sisters who love Jesus Christ to worship him. That's not just nostalgia for the psalmist. That's a picture of his future. That's a picture of his future. Despite how it feels now for the psalmist, those days are not over. Listen, the Bible is very realistic for the Christian about spiritual trials. You will face them. You'll face trials of all kinds. It warns us they're inevitable in this life. But it's also, it's also very, very, very optimistic about the outcome of those trials. Your tears may be consuming you today. You know what it's like to say with the psalmist that they, they're consuming you at night when you lay down. That's, that's your food. You know what that's like. God may feel distant. You may feel all alone in your circumstances. But remember, that's what we're called to do. Remember, hopelessness 
believes what your circumstances are saying. Faithlessness is willing to listen to even your own thoughts. But faith will not settle. Faith does not settle in those instances. It pushes back on those things by looking above those things and beyond those things. Look at how the psalmist, in verse 5, he reminds himself to look outside of himself and to look outside of his circumstances. He asks, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. We must, we have to remind ourselves that no matter the trial, that God is above those things, and that his promises are going to outlast those things. They haven't been weakened by the trial. They, his desire and to know that for sure has only grown in the midst of the trial. That's how you fly by your instruments. You talk to yourself. You remind yourself that goodness and mercy are ahead for you precisely because God is faithful and because he is your salvation, come what may, in your life. There's such a delight. There is such a delight in the word again. Again. You may not be able to stand up in the midst of your trial right now. You don't have enough energy to even do that, but this is low-hanging fruit right here. Hanging on the branch, you can just reach up and pluck it and be nourished in your soul. Again, I shall again praise him. There is a certain future in view for the psalmist. This is not the end for him. This is not the last word. There is, there is an again in his life. That is, that is the reminder there's an answering of a spiritual trial. Maybe you're in the midst of it right now. There is a reminder there for us this morning. Again, chew on that word. Let that word soak into you. I shall again praise him, my hope and my God. That is section one, how we answer spiritual trials. And we turn to section, the second section of the psalm, answering spiritual taunts. We're meant to notice and feel this striking contrast between the truth that he's just reminded himself of, the truth that we just saw, and his own feelings that come flooding back in, in the beginning of verse 6. He's, he's being honest about where he was. He may have had a peak of blue sky, but now it feels like the clouds just kind of close back in where it was. He says as he leads out, verse 6, again, this is, a, this is a dire, even honest man. He said, my soul is cast down within me. Maybe that's been true for your experience as well. You've said, hey, I, I've been in the midst of those trials, and I've tried to remind myself of what I know to be true. I've tried that. I've, I've tried to, to tell myself, no, this is, that's not right. This is what I know to be true. And, and maybe it felt like you didn't get very far with that. Maybe it felt like you were spinning your wheels, and, and you think, what, what's the point? Maybe it helped even briefly, but then immediately your, your feelings begin to just rush back in. But here again, though, note how the structure of this psalm is so helpful. It's so vital for us. How discouraging would it be if the psalmist came across as this inhuman person who's able just to say, yeah, I, I reminded myself one time, made, you know, I was off the path, made a course correction, and now we're good. I'm just going to be able to keep on going. But look, look at his journey. He says, He's not, constant, he's, not at, he's not at peace yet. He's still wrestling. And the Lord knows, even the structure of the psalm, the Lord knows that ongoing trials in our life, ongoing ta spiritual taunts in our life, they need re consistent reminders of truth to be consistently over and over again reminded. But you'll notice something else on this side of the psalm. You'll notice something different. The reminder in verse 5 has, has sent his roots just a little bit deeper. It's had an impact. Yes, despite still physically being a long ways away from the temple. from being The temple was the manifest presence of God on earth. He's still physically a long, long ways from the temple. But notice this. He's beginning to now see that God is not as far away as he thought. God is not as distant as he had imagined. He refers in verse 6 to this land of Hermon and Mount Mazar. That's probably where the region that he's been exiled to. It's the source of the Jordan River, and, and, and it sits up kind of high in, 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 on slopes. So the Jordan comes flowing down the slopes, and you imagine in, in rainy seasons just how fast that water begins to move down and flows down into the Sea of Galilee. And you can just see how the, these images that he uses where he talks about deep calls to deep and these roaring uh, of waterfalls and everything else. He may be sitting beside a bank watching it just 
flood, just move. But in sitting there and watching these waters surging along the banks, the psalmist begins to see that those banks are God's hands. God is in control. He's guiding these waters. He even is able to say, you know, he's able to say these, these breakers and these waves, they're, they're yours. You are in control of them. He's, just as the Lord is, is guiding the Jordan River along its banks that he may be watching flow right now, he's beginning to see that the Lord's hand is here. And he's guiding every step. This imagery of raging seas, of, of, of foaming waters that we talked about, it's used throughout the Old Testament. It's, a, it's an image that pictures chaos. It pictures a feeling of confusion and, a, and, and upheaval. It's, it's the opposite of land. Land is, is firm ground. Land is you can, you can stand there and you know where you are. These are waters that aren't tamed. These are waters that, that are uncontrollable. They're, they're overwhelming. They're not like the, the waters, the cool, refreshing waters of verse 1. This, this is a different kind of sea. They're deep and they're fast. And they've so overwhelmed this psalmist that he feels like he's being swept under by them. And just, just as, a, as a Jordan you know, is coming down, he, he recognizes that's how he feels in his life. He says, all your breakers, they're all your waves. But surprisingly, though, it's right here. This, this surprised me as I was reading through the psalm and studying this week. It's right here in the middle of this chaos. The way he feels and the way he sees things. That he switches how he references the Lord. In verses 1 through 7, you see that in, he's re- referring to him as God. That's your English translation for Elohim, which is totally appropriate. He's been referencing that. But in verse 8... He references him as Lord. That's, that's the translated name, Hebrew name of Yahweh. It's the name that the Lord revealed himself by as the covenant God of Israel, the one who had, had promised himself to be faithful to his promises. They would be his people, and he would be their God. And it's right here in the midst of this chaos, chaos that he's beginning to recognize that God is in control of, that he sees the Lord is here. He recognizes the Lord's presence, the covenant God of the temple. The one that's represented the temple is here. And he's here in the midst of it. And he's not just here in a passive way. He's not here in a way of an observer. No, he's here to keep his covenant. He's here to keep his promises. He's here to, I love how he phrases it, he's here to command his steadfast love. To give me something to stand on in the midst of the waves. He's right there in the middle of it. Yes, he's in control of it, but oh, he's right in the middle of it for for this psalmist. And he's right there in the middle of it for us today as well. That's why he's able to say that these songs begin to rise in his heart. At night, he says, your your song is with me. It's in verse 8, he says, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He's he's beginning to see. He's beginning to see that. And, And we too... We, too, are are supposed to see that God's love is unchangeable. His promises, they haven't lessened. See, his circumstances aren't any different. His circumstances are still the way they were when he started the song. As far as we know, nothing has changed. But his perspective is beginning to be changed. Verse 5, the thing that he reminded himself of is beginning to have its effect in his life. He's beginning to view it a little differently. And we're supposed to rejoice there's quite a change from the night and day in verse 3 to the night and day that we see now in verse 8. There's progress here. It's not perfect. We'll see in a minute that there's still questions that he has to deal with. There's still unanswered stuff that he's wrestling through. But look at the progress. Look at, the, look at, look at how he's learning to fly. He's supposed to rejoice in that with the psalmist. Circumstances are the same, but look at the growth. Be encouraged. Maybe it felt like it didn't make any difference when you were reminding yourself of that truth. But be encouraged. His, his growth, you're meant to be invited into that. That can be your growth. You can hang on and trust in these circumstances. Let that encourage you. As we see, though, that this, he's, still, he's still wrestling. His past just so curbed. I mean, it really is. That's, a, that's the thing. It's one of the things that stuck out. He's, he's just not, it's, it's, this is not a robot. This is a guy. And he's, and he's still wrestling. You see now, though, that there's faith and there's struggle that are present in his life, and they're battling inside of him. They're battling each other. His, his path is like ours. He still has to deal with the turmoil and the taunts. 
He still has this hard and perplexing questions of why. He's still dealing with the why. Why have you forgotten me? That's how he begins verse 9. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of, my enemy, of the enemy? His, he, verse 10, it just conveys how angry his, his adversaries are. You can almost feel his burden with him, as if he hasn't had enough to deal with, with all the other things. His enemies, they won't let up. He still has to answer their taunts. They aren't just minor things that he could sit down and, and work out with these guys. This is, this is a violent and it's an unjust oppression that he's dealing with. This expression here used for a deadly wound, it literally means if they could get their hands on me, the second they would get their hands on me, they would kill me. That's, that's the level of hatred and venom that they have for the psalmist. And it's just going so deep into him, he says, it's, it's deep in my bones. That's where I feel it. That's what I'm wrestling with. And the reason that they hate him is primarily because of his hope in God. You get this idea that if he would just deny his faith, if he would, if he would step back from this hope, that things may go better for him in his life. That things may improve. His circumstances could change. His enemies may even be willing to back down. But instead, here he is, them rejoicing in his humiliation, rejoicing in his downfall, jeering him. And it's important that we take heed of these verses. Because at some point in our life, as followers of Jesus Christ, that's going to be our experience. We don't get to escape this because we live in Texas in 2018. Make no mistake, if you desire to follow Jesus Christ in this life, you will experience unjust oppression. It will happen. Paul warned Timothy of this when he told him, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There may be internal at times where you're feeling an oppression. It may be external at times, but it's coming. The temptation that rises for us in those moments just like the psalmist, it's the exact same temptation. It's found in the question that you're taunted with. Where is your God? Where is your God? That's what, hit home. That's what hits home. We know that taunt, don't we? We've heard that voice before. What turmoil it can kick up in your soul, right? It's a question that you've wrestled with maybe in your own soul. You've heard it. It's unrelenting. In the dry, weary desert, it asks, where is your God? In the oppression of the enemy, it shouts, where is your God? In the still, lonely night, it, it whispers to your soul, where is your God? You're far from home. It's there. Where is your God? You're being overwhelmed in the flood. It's asking, where is your God? Surely, surely if he, for, if he were for you, this wouldn't be happening to you. Surely if he, if he had the ability to save you, he would have by now. Surely if he were powerful enough, or he loved you enough, or if he remembered his promises enough, he would have reached in and he would have pulled you out of the waves by now. That's what that voice is saying over and over. But notice again, it's right here. In the midst of these questions and these lies and these taunts, this, the, the faith, genuine faith, true faith, is unwilling to listen. Despite the turmoil the enemies of our souls can and they absolutely will cause, despite how meandering our path can be this side of heaven, despite the conviction that sometimes we have and sometimes we just don't have, genuine faith perseveres in these instances. It pushes back over and over. As many times as we need, we're invited. It invites us to look beyond ourselves, outside of ourselves, to trust in what we know to be true, Look at verse 11. It's, it's the same thing as verse 5. The psalmist, he has no problems telling himself the exact same thing again. This isn't one of those, no, I tried that, it didn't work. Listen, in a microwave generation that, that, I, that I grew up in, where everything's at your fingertips and, and it's got to be instant results, that's the temptation. I tried that and it didn't work. The psalmist, in the midst of these instances, he doesn't have any problem reminding himself again. No, 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 that's not true. The thing that I know, the whispers and the waves, the taunts and the torrents, none of those things, I know something better is true. I know something that is going to outlast all those voices. He asks himself again, why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. See that, that note that he strikes again? He's answering a spiritual taunt. This is the journey of a man he's learning. 
In the midst of a trial, he's growing. He's learning how to answer those trials, how to walk through those trials in faith. He's learning how to answer those taunts, those questions that come up over and over again. And what benefit his journey, what benefit his journey is meant for our souls, especially, especially when we're in the midst of turmoil, especially where we don't see the way forward. This is a man who we can come and relate to in those instances. There's something even richer here. If we take the time to look, not as clearly as, as we can see it, but the psalmist himself, he saw it. He saw it from afar. That's the reason why he could remind himself that God was his salvation. See, there's another man who endured trials and taunts way beyond even the psalmist who penned these words. He wasn't a righteous son of Korah. He was the perfect son of God. He too had enjoyed communion with God. His was complete in heaven itself. He knew unbridled joy with his father. But he also knew what it was like to be far from home. Unlike the psalmist who was forced into exile, perfect psalmist chose to come into exile. He chose to be made a human like us in every way, able to relate to us just like when we're seeing this psalmist story, we had this perfect son of God, he can relate to us that way. He too was hated for no reason at all. He too had lost it all. Tears were his food day to night. We've been listening to the experience of a suffering man, but it's only a pale shadow of the true suffering servant who came and whose anguish was deeper than any human before or since. If we look closely, we can see him there. Can you see him in the face down in the garden? Can you see the tears that flowed that night while his companions slept? Can you see his tortured soul that was in complete agony within him? Can you see him there on the cross? He didn't just feel abandoned by God. He was abandoned by God. Can you see his thirst for just one brief respite from his Father? Can you see each of the waves of God, all of your waves and all of your breakers, one by one, just crashing over him? Can you see it? They're sweeping him under. Can you hear the taunts of his enemies pointing to him as he hangs there and laughing? Laughing at him. Oh, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him if he desires. He saved others, but he can't even save himself. Let him come down if he's the son of God, and then, then we'll believe in him. Can you hear the jeering of Satan in his heart? Where is your God now? That question has never roared louder in a human heart than it did that afternoon. But if you lean a little closer, you can hear the perfect psalmist whispering to himself. He's in utter darkness. He's torn from his father. He's in unimaginable pain, but he's reminding himself what he knows. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Listen, for our sake, it was for our sake that Christ descended into the valley of the shadow of death, but he did so reminding himself of what was true. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. He knew what was true, and it's right here. It's right there in the triumph of the Lamb. In the triumph of the Lamb that we find our answer today. That's where our answer is. No, you can't answer the spiritual trial on your own. We don't have, have you felt that? We don't have the strength in ourselves. There's nothing in me that has the ability to answer those spiritual trials. But our answer is there. Our answer is on that hill. Our answer is in an empty tomb this morning. No, we, we can't answer the taunts on our own. We can't answer the where is your God except by pointing to heaven and saying, 
My God is right there. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He is interceding for me, and one day I too will be in His presence because He is going to come back for me. He, He has become my salvation. In the midst of the trials, in the midst of the taunts, the perfect psalmist has fulfilled everything. He's fulfilled everything. He has become my salvation. And not only has he fulfilled it, he's overcome everything. He overcame the trial that you're facing now. He overcame the questions that you're wrestling with now. He is your perfection and the one who held on faith perfectly, even when your faith begins to falter. He is the, he is the answer. He is the answer. So briefly, what's our response? It's our response to the words of this psalm. How do we live differently in light of this? First, for the Christian, we're to seek refreshment in God's Word. We've heard the last few weeks, there's, there's not another stream flowing. We live in a spiritual barren wasteland. There's not another stream flowing that's able to satisfy our souls, especially in the midst of trials, especially in the midst of taunt. It flows daily for us to drink deeply from to satisfy our thirst. Where else are we going to find satisfaction? Where else are we going to turn? Where else are we going to find light when everything around us is dark? How are you going to be able to answer that thought that pummels you in the middle of the night? God's promises don't fail in the storm. Use them to fly with. Seek refreshment in Christian fellowship. Implicit in the psalm is this danger of spiritual isolation, being cut off from other brothers and sisters. The psalmist experienced a forced separation. He, he was cut off from God's people, and you can see the heavy toll that that took on his life, the burden that that, that, that became for him. Why would we volunteer for that? Why would we volunteer to add that as a burden for our lives? We have brothers and sisters to come alongside us and to remind us of what is true and to help us in the midst of these circumstances, in the midst of the flood. You can begin that process today. If you're, if you're not involved in a small group, that's one of the reasons it's so vital in the life of our church. Or even if you are in name only, and you're not really involved, you're not really, it's not a priority in your life, let me urge you to commit to that. To commit to that. It's God's wise design for believers to be in fellowship with one another, especially when the trials come. We need each other for this journey. We absolutely have to have each other for this journey. And as you do these things, as you seek refreshment in God's Word, as you seek refreshment in God's people and fellowship with God's people, you've got to keep this in mind. It's not only the happiness and the health of your own soul that's at stake. The world around you is watching. They're watching very closely. They're watching to see if Christianity has any real answers, especially in the midst of trials. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones unpacks this in a, a book I highly recommend. It's this excellent book called Spiritual Depression. He writes, In a sense, a depressed Christian is a contradiction in terms, and he is a very poor recommendation for the gospel. We are living in a pragmatic age. People today are not primarily interested in truth, but they are interested in results. The one question they ask is, does it work? They are frantically seeking and searching for something that can help them. Now we believe that God extends his kingdom partly through his people. And we know that he has oftentimes done some of the most notable things in the history of the church. Listen to this. Through the simple Christian living of some quite ordinary people. Nothing is more important, therefore, than that we should be delivered from a condition which gives other people looking at us the impression that to be a Christian means to be unhappy, to be sad, to be morbid, and that the Christian is one who scorns delights and lives laborious days. The happiness of your soul, especially in the midst of trial, despite circumstances, is a way that God intends to extend his kingdom through you. It will open up opportunities. People, will, when they see your unwavering hope, when they see that, you, no, you're not perfect. You're not this robot who has it all together. As Christians, we, we aren't that. Well, our display is not our own, I, I mean, our display is not of our own ability not of our own grit, not of our own self-reliance, not of our own ability to pull ourselves out. Our reminder is that. Our hope is that. 
so that when people see us clinging to that and seeing how it changes us, their hope is not in us. They're not saying, I want to be more like so-and-so. Their hope, as they look, they see there is hope there. There are answers there. There's reality there. There's joy there. There's a thing that I need there. You are fighting a spiritual battle. You are fighting to extend the kingdom of God as you fight through spiritual trials. As you fight through and answer those questions, you are in the middle of a battlefield. And it's happening. That's why we're to seek refreshment in God's word. That's why we're to seek refreshment in God's people. You're in, you're in camp with your brothers and sisters. And we have the same, we have an answer. We have the answer. Last is, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, this psalm is an invitation for you. You may not have known it until, until just now, but you are far from home. You are far away from the God who created you to be in his presence and to find joy and peace as his son or daughter. Your sin has driven you far from him. And it's going to do whatever it takes to keep you in exile. It's going to kick up whatever question, whatever doubt, whatever it can do to keep you isolated and to keep you there. But when those moments come, you have no answer. You have no right to consider God as your own salvation. The judgment of his waves and his breakers are coming. And when they do, they will sweep you under. There won't be a place to stand. You will not have anything to cling to. But this morning, you can. You can drink from the living water. You can find eternal life. You can find satisfaction for your soul. The thing that you've always wanted and always desired but didn't know where to find it, it's right here. You can come drink today. Call. You heard the testimonies even this morning. Call on Jesus Christ where you sit right now. Call on the name of Jesus Christ. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. Ask Him to remove the thing that separates you from Him. To bring you into a relationship with the Lord Jesus and with God the Father. Listen, He died to pay the price for your sin. He was resurrected three days later, for your, so that, later so that you can be reconciled. You, not someone else, you can be reconciled. And he stands this morning. He's ready to save to the uttermost all who come to Him. So call on Him today. If you're listening right now and there's a voice inside you that's prompting you, that's drawing you in, respond to that voice. Look away from yourself. Look away from what you're trying to do to improve your circumstances. Look beyond that for the first time. Look above, look beyond. This is sure footing. This is footing that will, if it was going to collapse, if it was going to give way, if Jesus was going to be swept under, never to be found again, the perfect psalmist, it would have happened then. And it didn't. He faced it all. He faced it all. And he overcame. There is sure footing. Not that you can overcome, but that he has already. And that you can hope in him. That you can put this into your own words. That you, when you face the spiritual trials, and you, when you face the spiritual taunts, you can answer... Why? Listen, there's no other reason why you can talk to yourself and remind yourself of what's outside of yourself unless there's something actually there, some ground to stand on. This morning, as we look to another week, a week that, that we'll have spiritual trials, a week that, that certainly will have questions that arise in our soul. Our souls will be in turmoil. You can bank on it. Maybe Monday morning, maybe Thursday afternoon. Something's going to happen, and, and there will be this turmoil in your soul. And maybe it'll happen every single day, every second of the week. I pray not, but that, that may be your experience right now. But as you look to that, let this song remind you how to answer. Let it remind you how to answer. To talk to yourself in the midst of those things. Everything, everything is packed in this one little phrase. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, we thank you for 
the evidences of your grace that are all around us, for the testimonies of your grace that we heard today, for the rejoicing in new life, for the hope that we find in your word, for seeing the face of Jesus Christ in this song, and knowing that he's our answer. Nothing else will do, knowing that when those times come, he is our rock and he is our salvation. Lord, I pray that we as a church would be quick to turn away from those things that can't ultimately find us. We can't find hope in them. We can't find satisfaction in them. Lord, but we would be a church that runs to the gospel. That runs to Jesus Christ. The one who can relate to us. The one who, who bears scars now. He bears scars now. And we would find hope. Lord, we would find hope. And Lord Jesus, would you just move? If there's anyone here right now who is facing a particular period of trial or they're dealing with these questions, they know what these questions feel like. They feel like they're in this fog. I pray for them. They're wrestling in turmoil even right now. I pray that there would be peace spoken in their life. If there are those who don't know you, would they turn to you even now? In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that. And Lord, I pray that our response would bring many to you. That you would be glorified. We rejoice in you, Lord Jesus, and we will again praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.